Welcome to the 8-bit theory. Today we are accelerating BASIC on the Commodore 128 like a flash by using a BASIC compiler. It's no secret that programs written in Assembler are way faster than BASIC programs. Unfortunately, Assembler isn't really self-explanatory and seems to be too hard to get into for hobbyists. Nonetheless, BASIC programmers don't have to go with lower performance thanks to BASIC compilers. These are programs that directly generate Assembler output from BASIC input. This results in vastly improved performance for your BASIC programs. You'll find a lot of these for the C64, however for the C128 the air is getting thin. There is multiple flavors of BASIC compilers. On one hand, there's the fully fledged compilers. They aim for 100% BASIC compatibility. This means they can be used to compile any BASIC program. Blitz is one of my favorite BASIC compilers. On the 128 it accelerates programs about 5 to 6 times. On the other hand, there's microcompilers. They only support a subset of basic keywords, but on the upside they generate smaller machine code and program performance is even closer to assembly programs. Today we'll hear about the basic microcompiler that was introduced in 1985's August issue of the Run magazine. It was submitted by Victor Cortes and the paragraph below the headline promises unbelievable execution speed. Well, we'll see. A shout out goes to Egon Olsen, who shared this microcompiler on the German Forum 64. So, what can this microcompiler do? The article lines out very clearly how basic keywords are turned into assembler code. And this also visualizes the greatest limitation, the number of supported keywords. We have variable assignments, peak, basic arithmetic, and, and or, but advanced arithmetic functions like sine or cosine etc. are missing. Then we have if with equals, greater than, lower than, and not equals, but lower than equals and greater than equals are missing too. Print can do numeric variables, CRH string, and string constants, but apparently no string variables. And then we have sys, for, poke, go to and goes up, including related keywords like next or return. This provides a good overview, but before I talk more theory, we would like to see this in action. Oh, and by the way, we're still on the C64, but we wanted to see this on the C128, right? Unfortunately, I did not find a comparable microcompiler on the Commodore 128, and after checking how the compiler works, I was convinced that it should be really easy to port a couple of addresses over to the Commodore 128. Well, I estimated this to take about half a day. All of a sudden, I was busy doing this for about a week, including one or two night shifts. I don't want to go into too much detail, just so much how the 128 manages memory gave me quite a headache. I was thinking much too complicated. And besides that, I had to figure out how to extend the microcompiler itself with more features. I'll say some words about that a bit later. If you're interested in the mess under the hood, let me know in the comments. I'll gladly create the video about that then. Now, what is a microcompiler good for really? I'm not so much about theory, so I'll bring a real life example. I was tinkering with displaying EGA graphics on the C128's VDC chip and the reason for that is because I'm currently working on a historical trading simulation that heavily relies on an 18 column display. As a testbed for loading and displaying graphics, I picked ID Software's Rescue Rover from 1991. Right, ID Software, the place where Wolfenstein 3D was published one year later and Doom two years later. But I didn't just want to load a pre-processed file and display it on screen. I wanted to load, process and display the original DOS files on the C128. The project itself is not finished yet, but it already makes for a great example for today's episode. The reason is that for displaying these graphics, multiple very computation-heavy steps are involved. Modding wikishikari.net features a lot of details about many file formats from back in the day, and this includes Rescue Rover. The first step for displaying an image is to unpack it. The algorithm is very simple, it's RLE. RLE is short for Run Length Encoding. The way this works is that byte for byte is read. If a byte with value hex FE, which is 254 decimal, is found, the subsequent two bytes are to be treated in a special way. They represent a counter and a value. The value is to be written times the number of the counter. 
especially pixel graphics with large areas of the same color have a lot of recurring bytes. For Rescue Rover, images are compressed from one-third up to one-tenth of their original size. In BASIC, this algorithm is easy to implement. The microcompiler's focus is not on full programs but on the performance-hungry parts only. So, the main part of the program will remain in uncompiled BASIC and only the RLE algorithm will be compiled. We'll talk about a fully uncompiled version first and then we'll carve out the RLE part. An image file is between 16 and 90 blocks in size, which resembles 4 to 22 kilobytes. Unpacked images take up 32 kilobytes. This means we'll need between 36 and 54 kilobytes of RAM. I decided to put both files into bank 1. As our basic program only requires a few bytes of memory for variables, we have a lot of memory left for our needs. The first part of the program defines the memory boundaries I just mentioned and we're loading the compressed file. While we know that the uncompressed size is always 32 kilobytes, we're still reading this value from the first two bytes of the compressed file. Line 100 is where the fun is about to start. First, we're printing some variable values and in line 112 the RLE algorithm finally starts. I just cropped the interesting part so it's easier to concentrate on the essentials. Everything happens inside this loop. It runs as long as the expected output size is not yet reached. I also added some debug output every thousand bytes. This is just a progress indicator for our own convenience. Then we're reading the next byte. A value of 254 means that a compressed part is coming up. We'll jump into the unpack routine in line 200 then. Otherwise, we'll just write the byte to the output area as is. In the unpack routine, we're reading the following byte as the counter, the one after that as the value. Then we're writing the value times the counter to the output and return to the main loop. Finally, we're printing the duration to the screen and save the uncompressed file to disk. In regular BASIC, the RLE algorithm for roompick.rov takes 30,302 chiffies. This equals 503 seconds or 8 minutes and 23 seconds. This is way too long, no player wants to wait this long in addition to the regular loading time from disk. Now we see the Blitz 128 version of the same algorithm. I was running it in warp mode because it still took a while to finish. The runtime of the Blitz version is 4791 chiffies, which is still about 80 seconds or 1 minute and 20 seconds. Blitz 128 accelerates basic programs approximately by factor 6. Now to the microcompiler. How fast will the RLE algorithm be in this case? We have to split our program into two parts for that. Most of it will stay untouched, but we'll need to extract the RLE algorithm into a separate source file. The first question is how we can hand over variables between uncompiled BASIC and the compiled program. By poking them to a specified memory area, the compiled program can read them from there via peak. I left 8 bytes unused at address 2048 for exactly that purpose. And then we are putting a syscall where the main loop and the uncompressed routine used to sit. The syscall jumps to the compiled RLE algorithm. This is how the source code looks like. First, we are storing the current memory bank that was configured in the basic program. This allows us to restore the value when we end the compiled program. It would be very confusing to have a different bank setting after calling a sysroutine. Then follows the bank statement to switch to bank1. This is the only keyword that was added to the C128 version of the microcompiler. By the way, variable names can only be one character in length, so we're limited to 26 variables. After that, we're picking the variable names from the mentioned 8 bytes memory area. The RLE part itself also had to be changed a little bit, as do and loop are not recognized by the microcompiler. But that can easily be replaced by goto. Goto is compiled to a jump statement to a fixed address, so in this case goto is really fast. Besides that, reducing variable names to be single character only was the only change required. And now we will compile this. After the source file name we are also specifying the memory address. 
this defines the address of the syscall. I won't lie, it takes a while until you're used to all of the restrictions of the microcompiler and the compile process only outputs very limited information in case of errors or problems. So it happens that compilation succeeds, but the compile program still crashes because a rule was violated. So going forward, I'd like to improve that part of the microcompiler, so any problems should be stated as part of the compilation process already. Now finally we'll execute the microcompiled RLE algorithm. And I had to run the program twice to make sure that there wasn't a mistake. Because the microcompiled version of the RLE algorithm only takes 295 jiffies, Compared to Blitz, this is an increase of factor 16, and compared to interpreted BASIC, the program is 100 times faster. It's important to mention that the microcompiler is most effective when no screen output is involved. Printing to the screen would take away a lot of the speed. Nonetheless, the MC128 is still perfectly usable for fast screen printing routines, however, these won't be 100 times faster. According to Run Magazine, the main reason for the limitations is the size of the program. It was a type-in program after all. And maybe the limitations were just few enough to still allow for meaningful tasks to be fulfilled. And this example probably proves that the microcompiler is ready for meaningful tasks. So let's go into more details of the limitations. No string variables. Integer variables are only valid from 0 to 65535. Print string is allowed. Print numbers is allowed. Print chr string is also allowed. But no string variables are allowed, like ti string or self defined a string. No floating point numbers, no negative numbers, no operator precedence, no parentheses. You can still do calculations with negative numbers, but not print them. For peak, it's important to note that it has to be the first expression after the equal sign. H equals H plus peak results in an error. Nesting if or for is not possible, so no ifs in ifs, no inner and outer loops. If in for is allowed, of course. Also, no arrays, unfortunately, but the article explains how to use peak and poke instead. Also, I gave an example on how to do this in my video about memory expansions. Get and input are not supported, but you can directly read the keyboard buffer via peak 213 instead. Sys on the C128 can take more parameters, but for the microcompiler it only accepts one single parameter. So no sys with address, accumulator, x register, y register and status register, only sys with address. The entry point of the compiled routines is an important aspect for your program. All jumps inside the compiled program are dependent on that. So if you want to put your compiled program into a different address in memory, it needs to be recompiled accordingly. Using multiple different compiled algorithms could become really tedious, as you'd need to calculate the start address of every single one. If the length of one compiled program changes, all subsequent ones need to be moved so you don't end up with gaps or overlaps in memory. One way to solve this is to put all your algorithms into a single source file. You then start this common source file with go-tos to each single algorithm, and each algorithm is concluded with the AND keyword. Looking at the assembly, we can see that the first go-to will appear at the start address plus 6. Each subsequent go-to comes 3 bytes later. This is because in machine code a jump command is 3 bytes long. So we can start our first algorithm by calling sys at hex address 1306 and just add 3 for each subsequent one. As mentioned earlier already, a big shout out goes to Egan Olson. He shared this microcompiler on forum 64. In addition to that, Egan converted the C64 version of this microcompiler to JavaScript. This means you can use your browser to compile basic programs into machine code. This is a lot faster and more convenient than mounting a disk image, loading the microcompiler in the emulator, typing in the basic program name and then watch the compilation progress. 
I'll have to see how to get this done for the C128 version too. The link to this will be in the description, so you can try it out. That's it for today. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and check the list of videos. I'm pretty sure there is more for you. If you find a need for a microcompiler in your own project, I definitely want to hear about it. Thanks for watching. See you next time here on the 8-bit theory.